Good afternoon and welcome to the May 2021 Dibble webinar, where we're going to talk with Ali Fry about co-regulation strategies, a way to build self-regulation in youth. So before I begin, my name is Kay Reed. I'm the executive director of the Dibble Institute. I'm curious, I just want to know two things about you. And if you would go over uh, to your dashboard, there's a place you can raise your hand. So I'd like you to raise your hand if this is your first ever Dibble webinar. I'd like to welcome all our new people to the webinar. Great, it looks like about 15% of you are new, so welcome to you. And uh, to those of you who are, are uh, have been to our webinars before, uh, welcome back. Uh, there's many names on this, um, of the hundreds who are here, uh, many names that I recognize, so I welcome you. Now, my second question, this is in the reverse, how many of you use a Dibble program in your work or have used a Dibble program in your work? Just curious how many there are. So put down, you need to put down your hands. Let me look. Put down the hands. Okay, so start over. How many of you use a Dibble program in your work? Okay. It looks like about 8%. So we're pleased to have you here. And for those of you who have not used a Dibble program, I just assume you haven't used a Dibble program yet. <laughs> so anyway, we're glad to have you here. Uh, next slide. Uh, to demystify the Dibble Institute a little bit, because we sound like we're a big organization and we are, but we were started by these two lovely people, Charlie and Helen Dibble. Um, who saw issues that young people had either in developing intimate, healthy intimate partner relationships or whose uh, lives would fray and derail if their parents' relationships or their families started to destabilize. So Charlie especially had the idea of taking research in this field of relationship education and family formation and translating it into, into practical teaching tools that then we make available widely throughout the country. Next uh, slide. So the Dibble Institute um, is an independent national nonprofit. Last year, we estimate we reached 75 over 75,000 youth. And we is the royal we because Dibble does not do direct services. Instead, we rely on people like you to spread um, and to teach these materials out in the field. Um, as I said before, uh, we create practical teaching tools, and you may know some. Love Notes, Relationship Smarts Plus, and Mind Matters are some that are uh, very popular right now and, and much used. And just as a brief, um, we're so happy moment, uh, Mind Matters was just added to the LA County's approved list for prevention and early intervention programs to help young people with trauma, especially as they come back to school. So um, just wanted to share that exciting tidbit with you. So we're really, um, we're, anyway, that's who we are. So the next slide, one of our key, we have several key values, but the one I wanna to talk to you about today is we are like all in on research. Our programs are research-based. We research and evaluate our programs or we support uh, people who do. And we also support other kinds of research. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is this project um, that the federal government funded um, on the best ways to determine what are some good ways to develop self-regulation in youth by increasing, co by teaching adults co-regulation strategies. So uh, let me introduce you to Ollie Fry. Ollie um, is our speaker today. Uh, she's an, uh, she works for public strategies, but she does a lot of work with the Office of Planning and Research. Uh, in Washington, D.C., and also the Family Office of Family Assistance. She has a master's in nursing. Um, she's a translational scientist, nurse educator, curriculum developer around this field of family formation um, and, and early family life. Today, we're going to talk about this study she did. And for full disclosure, I served on the technical working group of experts with her. I had that honor and privilege, as did Carolyn Curtis. Um, and some of our clients participated in the work, most notably Children's Harbor, Florida, and More Than Conquerors in Georgia. So, Ali, thank you for joining us today, and um, you can keep going. Great, Esther, if you could, there you go, great. 
Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all today. And I also wanna say that I'm excited for the young people in your lives because you're taking time to join me in thinking about this idea of co-regulation and how you can integrate that into your practice as a way to support their development. They're the lucky ones to have you taking your time to do this. I mean, this is a big, big step. Um, and thanks for spending your time on yet another webinar. <laughs> So let me start by saying nobody gets to make a presentation like this based on only their own effort. Um, I have had the great fortune of working with a killer team. Um, so I wanna thank my SARAM partners, Scott, Mindy, Chelsea, and the broader team at Public Strategies and our partners at Mathematica, um, who worked tirelessly since 2017 to bring some of these tools to life and to your doorstep. Uh, and I also want to thank Kay for mentioning Children's Harbor and More Than Conquerors, specifically Rachel, Flip, and Greg. They were the, the folks on the ground, and we did a lot of collaboration with practitioners to develop these strategies. These were not created in academia and then brought to you. These were created on the ground with youth, like the youth you serve. And then I want to acknowledge the work of Drs. Desiree Murray, Katie Rosenbaum, and Christina Christopoulos. They produced the Self-Regulation and Toxic Stress Series funded by the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation. Their literature, their intervention reviews, their theoretical frameworks, they were the springboard for the work that we did to translate the science of self-regulation and co-regulation into practical, actionable steps for the field. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna repeat the link to access their resources, their tip sheets and products, but you can see here on this slide is also a link to those things. There's a lot of tools that we're developing and have developed under the SARAM project um, that are also accessible to you. And then I want to thank Drs. Alita Meyer and Karen Blitz. They're our federal project officers, experts in this field as well, um, and they had the, the intuition, insight, and fortitude to bring our project, uh, the funding it needed to create these products and tools for you. Next slide. So what we're gonna to talk today is about co-regulation strategies. I'm gonna get at what that looks like and what that means here in a minute, but they're practical tools for you. And this presentation is based on the work of SARAM. SARAM stands for Self-Regulation Training Approaches and Resources to Improve Staff Capacity for Implementing Healthy Marriage Programs for Youth. So the context of this project was HMRE programs or Relationship Education Programs for Youth. But the reach of these tools could be far more extensive than that. Um, let me take a quick poll, if you don't mind. I want to know, in what capacity do you work with youth? Do you work one-on-one, -on -one, in groups? Do you do both? Or maybe you run programs, or you are here for personal interest, or you do other kinds of work, and you don't work directly with youth. Take a minute to submit your answer. Hmm. All right, okay, so most of you work in both one-on-one -on -one settings and in groups. A handful of you run programs or do other kinds of work, or maybe you're here for personal interest, or maybe you do technical assistance. Some of you work just in groups, and a handful of you work just one-on-one. -on -one. What I wanna share with you is that the tools that I'm gonna share with you today, um, they were created for groups and individual work. So you can tailor these strategies to your own unique context and be thinking about that as you hear me talk today. I have a second poll. I'm curious for those of you who do work with youth, what age range are, um, are the youth that you serve? And it's okay for you to select more than one age range if the youth you serve are across a wide variety. All right, we've got the results. Hey, hot dog. <laughs> Most of you work with middle school or high school age youth. Good, good news, the programs that we worked with um, served mostly high school or young adults. So that's the majority of you. So the things that we're gonna talk about today really land for uh, the young adults and youth that you serve. So the goal for the funding of this project was to apply the science of self-regulation development in context to youth serving programs. We worked with a couple of different uh, funded sites and what we did is we co-created with them 
practical strategies and actually some measures that were aimed at bringing co-regulation to life in practice. Um, so what is co-regulation? We're gonna spend some time talking about that today, but basically it's the supportive modulation of one nervous system by another. Think of it as like the transfer of regulatory skills between people through modeling, through observation, practice, reflection. It can occur in interpersonal interactions where one person like any of us on this webinar supports another person to manage intense emotions, to redirect their focus to the task at hand, and to make complex decisions that keep them you know, wise about their future. Sounds like the kind of stuff we care about, right? <laughs> so today we're gonna talk about, um, it's not rocket science, but we're gonna talk about how we can be more intentional about the co-regulation um, science, about co-regulation approaches as we serve youth in our programs and practices. Next slide. I like to think about this work as how we teach, not just what we teach. So what is self-regulation? Because it's hard to talk about what co-regulation is, this pile of regulatory words, without first grounding ourselves in the term self-regulation. So what do we mean by it and why does it matter? Next slide. Self-regulation is the act of managing our thoughts and our feelings so that we behave in ways that help us reach our goals. You'll see it represented by this triangle here that has three different types of regulation, cognition, emotion, and behavior. So how do I manage my thoughts? And I can. How do I manage my feelings? And how do those things roll up to me making choices to behave in ways that help me reach my goals? The thing about self-regulation is that it's a term that's often used interchangeably with other terms, and they don't always mean the same thing. So you might hear words like executive function, effortful control, delayed gratification, impulse control. Think about self-regulation as like the umbrella term, the overarching term that encompasses those other things. And also self-regulation is a system. Um, it's composed of multiple components. So in the cognition bucket, it's stuff like executive function, or control of attention, or perspective taking. And then in the emotional bucket, it's things like my reactivity, or the regulation of the timing and the intensity of my emotions. And then in the behavioral bucket, it's things like, how do I express myself? How do I behave, obviously? But then it also includes things like personality traits and temperament. Um, so we see skill, we see actions, co-regulation and action is stuff like making complex decisions, being introspective, thinking about your thinking, um, avoiding paying attention to the shiny squirrel in the background, you know, um, keeping your focus on your goals, identifying and labeling emotions, having empathy, compassion, persisting on a task or being able to tolerate distress, considering the perspective of others, things that we do all the time or wish we did all the time, but we don't always think of as self-regulation. That's Those skills are part of that bucket. Next slide. Why do we care about this? Well, when we're able to manage our thoughts and feelings, we can handle stress in our jobs. We can handle things in our relationships. We might avoid quick re reactions that we're gonna regret later. We can make short-term and long-term plans because we can think ahead. Um, and ultimately, we're more effective partners, parents, practitioners, when we are um, strong in our self-regulation. Next slide. Well, why does it matter? Turns out it is absolutely pivotal. It's foundation. It undergirds individual and collective or community well-being. Research shows that it mediates a ton of individual and community-based outcomes. For example, in adolescents, when we are um, when adolescents are strong in their co-regulation skills, they have greater resilience. They cope with stress in positive ways. Um, they have higher social competence. A lack of regulation, on the other hand, predicts things like emotional eating or substance use or sexual risk taking. And across the lifespan, self-regulation is gonna predict physical health, mental health, educational attainment, employment, financial stability, and then of course, relationship satisfaction and stability. So if you think about it, Self-regulation is underpinning most of what we want to achieve in our youth programs and services, and it's malleable. So it's responsive to inter interventions. That means we can impact self-regulation through our programming. Super powerful thing to know. Next slide. So self-regulation is not a trait you're born with or not. It develops over time, and it develops in the context of supportive relationships and environments. So that's why supporting self-regulation development in the youth we serve is a hugely important focus 
for us as practitioners. Think about it this way. You may serve youth who have not had supportive relationships and contacts, and you may be the only lifeline for someone to learn self-regulation skills. Self-regulation is developed just like reading is. It requires basic foundational skills. So for reading, it might be recognizing letters. For self-regulation, it might be um, understanding what's happening in your body, feeling your, your sense, you know, feeling what's happening physiologically. And then those building blocks um, serve to support more complex skills. So for reading, it might be recognizing words, stringing them into sentences, that sort of thing. For self-regulation, it's things like labeling that physical sensation with a corresponding feeling. So the tightness in my chest, that's stress, that's anxiety. So those things layer on top of each other. And it's very important to recognize that not everyone had the foundational set of skills they needed to scaffold the more complex skills they need. So birth regulation maybe looks like consoling a crying baby and helping them return to calm. But in young adulthood, self-regulation looks more like, hey, I can empathize with, with you, my partner, even when we disagree, or I can understand your point of view, and I'm going to choose to respond in this moment, this tense moment, in a way that's best for our relationship, not just in a way that I want, right? Next slide. So this is an ecological framework, and it was published by Desiree Murray, and I want to take a second and encourage you, and if you could put this in the chat for me, um, Desiree did a self-regulation webinar for Dibble in 2018, and if you want to do a deeper dive into what self-regulation is and how it develops, please feel free to watch that webinar. This image is from the uh, Toxic Stress series that I mentioned before, and it shows the factors that influence self-regulation development. So at the center is stuff like our biology, the skills we're taught, those play a role in our self-regulation. But notice the even bigger pictures are caregiver support, environmental context, right? We're back at it again. The circles can interact with each other. So like my environment can influence my biology. So it's super important for us to really spend some time thinking and placing some intention around what is the environment I've created for youth? How am I showing up for them and providing care? The irony is that self-regulation implies that we do this all on our own. It's kind of a bootstraps term, but in reality, self-regulation has so little to do with the self, at least in terms of things we have control over as individuals. It has a lot more to do with our DNA, which we can't control, or the environment that we're in, the quality of the relationships that we have or don't have. And think about this, society often mistakenly assign, or we mistakenly assign blame for a lack of self-regulation to the individual committing the offense. She's out of control, or he's making really bad choices, right? Rather than flipping it and understanding that making decisions or being in control, those are skills that come with um, coaching and not everyone has had an opportunity for that. And the reality is that human beings need support and encouragement and coaching in safe nurturing environments in order to develop these skills. Next slide. So if our experiences shape our self-regulation abilities and skills, then if we're in supportive environments and relationships, we're more likely to develop strong self-regulation. On the flip side, trauma, stress, the absence of support, that slows or inhibits the processes that promote self-regulation in the brain, right? So when we're faced with chronic or acute stress, poverty, trauma, the brain's not getting the chance to recover from the impact of that stress. So the brain overreacts to what we might think of as normal stressors. It turns up the decibel level. And that makes it so much harder to control impulses or delay gratification. Our cognitive energy is depleted for paying attention or planning. We can't make decisions. We can't solve problems. There are increases in negative mood, anger sensitivity. So think about it that way. Um, an individual may overreact or shut down emotionally in the presence of this chronic or acute stress. So young people who have faced adversity beyond their ability to cope, they demonstrate delayed self-regulation often. Let me have you click if you don't mind. This is a picture of a healthy nerve cell. Inside the circle is a beautiful picture of a web of neurons and they connect different parts of the brain, right? Note the branches, the color, how many of them there are, okay? This is a brain cell where neurons have been affected by a lack of support in the face of trauma, stress, or adversity. Look at how many fewer branches are here. We cannot connect the dots between the parts of the brain that help us plan or use logic and feelings to problem solve. We can't see the long-term view when the wiring has been short-circuited. 
So the stress and the trauma combined with a lack of support, that actually physiologically alters the brain. And then the behavior that we see creates a negative feedback loop, right? It's hard to support a person who's impulsive or violent, but the brain can't heal from stress and trauma. It cannot build new branches without that support. So hopefully you're starting to see your role and its critical importance in the lives of the youth you serve. The good news is that we know that the brain is neuro, has neuroplasticity. We know it's malleable. That means we can rewire and regrow new connections in the presence of positive supports. Next slide. There's two stages where the brain is particularly responsive to experiences and where its growth and development is very uh, intense um, and shapes the architecture of the brain. So you've likely heard about the importance of the zero to five age range. But in the last decade, we've learned the second stage is really critical and that's adolescence. The rate of brain development occurring in this stage, it mirrors that of infancy. So I like to tell folks, here's your second shot, <laughs> make it count, right? Not only are adolescents undergoing structural changes, they're navigating social emotional changes as well. So think about this list. They're getting more independent. They're increasing their autonomy. They're, I, they're forming and developing their identities. They're prioritizing peer relationships because the caregiver adolescent relationships are renegotiating. They're creating their own independent selves, but they're also vulnerable. They have more exposure, more access. They're more mobile. Um, and so they're at higher risk and need support. This is interesting. Adolescents have difficulty differentiating emotions when they occur at the same time. I'm sad, I'm angry, which one am I? It's difficult to differentiate between those things. Youth need coaching. But here's the thing, often as youth proceed through this developmental period, our support as adults declines. We think, oh, they're independent, they don't need us as much. Not so. The need for adult support, including non-parental support, is critical for adolescents and young adults, but it's different. It's a different kind of support. So as social demands and stressors increase, young people need us to really coach them as they learn and use the skills that'll help them gain perspective. Remember, they don't have experience that they're gonna come out the other side of some of these stressors. We know they can. So they need us to hold a long-term vision for their world, for their well-being. And we really need to be sure that vision we hold for them is rooted in their values and their goals. Next slide. Here's something fascinating to me. The strategies and approaches for adults to support adolescent and young adult self-regulation, they're not integrated into our interventions, as it turns out. So this slide displays some of the key reports that have been published um, in the Self-Regulation and Toxic Stress series. Um, and Desiree and others conducted a review of interventions, self-regulation interventions, like 300 programs or so. Look at this graph on the bottom right. There is a dearth of interventions for high schoolers and young adults that help them build self-regulation, but the brain needs that development. So combined, there are only 17% of self-regulation interventions. Next slide. Of those interventions, only 5% of them are for high, for high schoolers and none for the young adults targeted co-regulation, meaning none of them addressed how adults could support, coach, model, and foster self-regulation through their supportive actions. So in other words, my, my federal project officer, Alita, often says that programs saw open the heads of youth, you know, open them up like they're on a hinge and pour skills into their brains. But we, and we expect a bunch of positive outcomes. But what we know is that self-regulation is more effectively developed in the context of relationships and secure environments. So why are we not also simultaneously developing the knowledge and skills of the adults who work with youth in the context that youth are already in? And I know Dibble has a bunch of programs that you can take online uh, that help with some emotion regulation. So there are great things beginning to emerge now. Um, and the good news is that's exactly what we did in the SARM project. We developed evidence-informed approaches that could be layered onto existing programs. But here's the key, they don't require a new curriculum. You can do them in any curriculum you use. Next slide. So um, the pilot sites we worked with were from currently funded ACF grantees implementing relationship education programs for youth. Um, and we co-created these strategies with practitioners who were on the ground. And here are the two different sites we work with. And I wanna call attention to the very different um, context these two sites were. So one site, uh, Children's Harbor, I'm sorry, More Than Conquerors, taught health classes to 14 or 15 year old youth in, in um, high schools. 
they use relationship smarts and there were about nine facilitators that we worked with to develop the strategies there and test them and then children's harbor worked with 17 to 23 year old young adults predominantly Afro african american and those youth were in foster care and had aged out talk about a lack of support right so these youth were expected to be very high functioning instantly and had really had a lack of nurturing environments um, until that point so we had some great and different sites with whom we could work to develop this stuff so before we dig into uh, co-regulation and some some strategies for enacting it in your practice i have a reflection question for you next slide so if you could put in the um, question section of your um, control panel what is one piece of information that i've shared so far that you have heard um, that you really want to keep in mind going forward in your practice Sorry. <laughs> Good timing. So please write that in the question box. In the question um, box. Not in the, I think that's what you said, Ollie. Just yeah. Um, so Donna says training adults who she wants to remember to train adults who work with youth about co-regulation, about the support that is needed for high school students and young adults, said Vanessa. Adolescent skills are vital. Self-awareness and self-regulation is a skill that takes practice. Training camp counselors about their roles, increasing the support for high school and young adults. Brain growth mirroring infancy in adolescence. I mean, I could go on and on. That's great. <laughs> and for some reason, Kate, I'm not able to see those, but it's okay. I'm grateful that you read them. And it sounds like you're all thinking about what's important to keep in mind here, and that's perfect. Now let's turn to what co-regulation is. Um, so next slide for me. And I'm sorry because the phone went off and I don't know how to turn it off. So hopefully it doesn't go off again. <laughs> um, so what is co-regulation and why does it matter? Well, the most basic definition is that co-regulation is the interactional process between two people that fosters self-regulation development. Next slide. How do we foster self-regulation? Well, here's our self-regulation triangle. And it's going to be fostered by three key domains. If we put our attention on these three key domains, we will be successful at fostering self-regulation development. So, so co-regulation is the supportive approach implemented by adults that prioritizes warm relationships. You notice I keep using that word warm. Cold relationships are not as effective. <laughs> Business-like relationships are not the same thing. So warm, responsive relationships, nurturing environments, and then in that context, you're coaching and modeling self-regulation skills. When I see that you're upset and I slow my breathing, I put my arm around you, walk you to a quiet space and listen and talk with you, I'm co-regulating. When I put posters up on the walls in my program office or in my workshop space, and those posters remind you to keep your cell phone in your bag, and I do the same, and it's so that we can focus on each other and achieve the goals we set out to achieve, I'm co-regulating. So babies rely almost 100% on adults to help them regulate. Adolescents have a lot of development happening in their brains. While they may need less co-regulation support than babies, they need a lot more than adults. And those who've experienced trauma, violence, chronic or acute stress in the absence of support, they're gonna need more co-regulation than those who have not experienced these things. It's important to also note that people with ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, other regulation affecting challenges, they may need more co-regulation support than others. So this is a lot of who we serve. The truth of the matter is we all need co-regulation sometimes, especially on the coattails of a global pandemic, right? We need it for relationships, we need it to learn, we need it to feel a sense of belonging and acceptance. Next slide. So we did a big literature review of 100, 500 plus articles looking for co-regulation strategies and we found almost none. So it turns out this is a real burgeoning new focus in the field. So we created a, a framework, a co-regulation framework to guide the development of our strategies. Um, and this is the goal of this framework. It's kind of complex, but the idea here is to show how these three things interact. First at the center is youth self-regulation. Then you'll see we pulled apart that Venn diagram and created a donut, relationships, environment, and skills coaching, and the qualities necessary for those different, uh, different um, domains. And then around that, like a hug, is adult self-regulation. So 
that encourages us to consider ways to strengthen our own self-regulation when we're providing co-regulation support to you. So this guided the development of our, of our uh, strategies. Next slide. Here's the thing. You know this. Maintaining warmth, warmth, ensuring a safe environment, being on task for skills coaching, it's not always easy. We get stressed. We get upset, all sorts of things. Life events make it hard for us to manage our own thoughts and feelings and in-the-moment reactions. Yet it's important to realize that our success as co-regulators hinges on our own self-regulation. So we have to remember that like the youth we serve, we need to make sure these co-regulation conditions, relationships, environments, and ongoing coaching, we need those ourselves in our workplace in order to focus more fully on the youth who need us most. So the first step in becoming a skillful co-regulator is to practice your own self-regulation. And research says that we're most effective in our work with youth when we are aware of our feelings and our responses to stressful situations, when we notice our assumptions, our thoughts, our beliefs about the behavior of youth. So what is the narrative in my head, in your head, about the youth you serve? Or what is the story inside your head about any one particular young person that you may have a difficult time interacting with? Be thoughtful about that and notice how that changes your behavior. And then use strategies to remain calm and respond with compassion, even when you're stressed, because your response is a model for the youth you serve. So let's dig in and talk about these co-regulation strategies. Next slide. When it comes to our own self-regulation first, this is the oxygen mask image <laughs> without actually putting a mask on the, on the slide, it helps us to ask ourselves some questions to see where we have opportunities to practice more intention. What do you do in the moment when you start to feel very angry with someone? What thoughts come to mind when things don't go your way? Do the thoughts make things better or do they make things worse? How do you calm down when you feel stressed or overwhelmed? Do you notice yourself wishing you'd acted differently or regretting something you've said? I think we've all done that. What could you have done differently? What do you do to stay focused on your overarching priorities when something in the short term gets in the way? So then these big picture questions, you can ask yourself these questions as you're thinking about your role in your practice. How do I fill my own tank? How do I ensure I come to work with a full tank? Because the youth need me to do that. And what will help me model self-regulation even if I'm under stress? So for me, that means taking a deep breath and noticing my physical sensations, figuring out what that tells me I'm feeling, and then checking in as to what that means about my assumptions, my expectations, my values. So I'm feeling annoyed by this participant. What does that feeling tell me about my expectations for them? What does it tell me about what I value or what I need? What might this young person need from me? Next slide. So strategies for practicing and enhancing your own self-regulation. Mindfulness. Hey, we love apps, you know, calm, headspace, that sort of thing. And we love this stuff um, that Dibble has put forth in Mind Matters. Healthy personal habits always make a difference. Again, check your narratives. What are the stories in your head about the youth you serve? And how can you change those stories or consider a different option that changes your behavior? Structure your work environment. What do you need to do to make sure that you can focus and you can keep on task with the goals? How can you support each other in your workplace, positive feedback um, and other co-regulation approaches? And above, above all, as we continue to practice and grow our own self-compassion, our own self-regulation, we can turn our attention to the three domains of co-regulation as um, in terms of supporting youth. Next slide. So here's a few reflection questions as you look at this uh, Venn diagram. Think about these. Does each participant, and I mean each one, in your program believe you care about them and know you're there if they need you? How can you tell? Does each young person feel welcome? Do they feel they belong? It's easy to find that answer for the extroverted, warm, interactive, engaged youth, but what about the ones that are less likely to be engaged? Does each young person feel safe in the workshop or program? Are they able to focus on learning? Is the program space free from distractions? How about do they have an opportunity to learn, practice, and reflect on the skills they're learning in your program? All of those different steps. Um, do they see you modeling positive management of thoughts, feelings, and behavior? And then questions for you. Do you experience these qualities in your workplace? 
or your relationships with coworkers? Do you have the ability to practice and reflect on skills that you're learning and teaching? Do you see changes that you can make in actions that you can take to strengthen your relationships environment or the skills coaching you experience? Go ahead and click. This is a list of a few strategies that we developed. We developed actually 23 initial strategies and then we fleshed out 14 of them and, you, and tested them in a formative rapid cycle evaluation, meaning we tried them, we got feedback, we tweaked the strategies, tried them again and did this three times. So you're getting a sneak preview because these six strategies are gonna be published this month in a co-regulation in practice series, that's what it's called, on OPRE's website. So um, you're getting hot off the press information. Next slide. All right, so let's focus first on warm and responsive relationships. This is the foundation. Um, these are four behaviors that are central to the kind of relationships we mean. So responding with warmth and affection. Ask someone to measure how many microaggressions, how many slighting or judgmental comments might exist um, in, your, in your workshops that you aren't even aware of. Um, to what extent are you validating feelings, offering support during intense emotions? Can you share your perspective and allow youth to make decisions and experience their own natural consequences, but with your nurturing support? Can you show and encourage compassion for yourself and others? Tuning into this domain calls us to consider the perspective of each and every young person we serve. So does everyone believe that I care about them and know that I'm there if they need me? Next slide. So, in use, so we developed this strategy called the welcoming strategy. It has three parts. Again, not rocket science. It's about intention and structure on something we know works. So what we did here is we said, okay, when I'm getting ready to teach a workshop, I'm usually pretty distracted by preparing and getting my space ready, getting my slides ready. What can I do to focus on something else? So the first thing you can do in these programs um, or in this strategy is offer a worksheet on the first workshop or the second workshop. The worksheet is here on the slide that we had youth fill out and it just empowers or gives, um, gives uh, agency to young people to say, here's what I prefer. So I'd like you to call me this. Something I'd like you to know about B is this. In class, I really like it when you do the following. So this helps youth feel like they have some control over the environment that you're creating in the classroom. Then second, greet. So instead of getting ready to do your work, can you stand at uh, the door or some part of the program space where the participants are arriving and smile and make eye contact with each person? Very simple, right? Say hello and greet each person by name. So that may mean you need to make structural changes in your program to be sure everyone has a name tag or there's some way that you can know each person by name. And then include a friendly gesture or some way of saying hello. We had one of the uh, one of the educators in one of the sites we worked with had nicknames for each of the youth that he worked with, and it was a very endearing thing, and they all felt very known. <laughs> and then the final step of the welcoming strategy is meeting them, connecting with youth one on one intentionally for a few minutes during each workshop. So you might do uh, one youth in the first workshop or two youth in the first couple of workshops. You're connecting and asking relevant, personalized questions about how they're doing, the skills they're trying out. I heard your grandma was sick, how is she? Um, and you're also prioritizing connecting with youth that are quieter or less engaged. And we recommended that educators keep track of who they're connecting with so that they are connecting with everyone in the first few workshops and making notes. Again, this is not rocket science, but this is making intentional and systematic the things that we know make a difference. Next slide. So this is about safe, supportive environments. So our environment can mean the physical space we're in, the way the tables are set up, the chairs, the temperature, the lighting, pictures or images that are on the wall, but it can also mean the culture or the climate of a program, the class, the workshop, the feeling that youth get when they enter the space and interact together. So consider their responses to questions like, hey, do I feel safe here? Is this place for me? Can I do what I need while I'm here? Can I focus? Sometimes there are parts of our program environments that aren't under our control, but let's take a minute to think about what is under our control. Um, what can we do to shape that physical and emotional environment so that participants can really feel safe? One of the ways is to create group values, you, group values with your youth. You'll notice it doesn't say ground rules. A lot of times um, we see practitioners creating ground rules that are practitioner driven, 
youth responsibility, like you have to follow the rules I create for you in this environment. And what we want to do is change that and so that youth are creating the environment they know they can thrive in. Um, other key um, components of supportive environments are offering anticipatory guidance, incentivizing good choices, giving youth space to calm down. Let's go to the next slide. Rest and return is a strategy, the name of a strategy we tested not only in classrooms for um, with youth, but also in the workplace. It's like taking a mental or physical break from life or emotions or when something in the workshop is triggering or intense. It's, an, it's a way to refuel, rest, refocus. So it can mean physically leaving the room, moving to another space, or it can mean putting your head down, taking a mental break, checking out, looking out the window. The idea is you're committing to taking, taking care of your needs, but you're also committing to coming back. The return part of the strategy is like how we know that this is not abandonment, it's not disengagement or checking out, it's self-care with a promise to re-engage. Um, this is key to, to give youth permission to try and to coach them to use in programs and in life. And it's really helpful for staff to use this at work. So in the classroom, we would make this part of our group values. We would say, okay, sometimes the stuff we're talking about in these workshops bring up intense feelings, you know? If that happens to you, it's okay to take a break, come back in a few minutes, and we're, we're gonna call that rest and return. The idea is you have our permission as a group to either physically step out or mentally check out when you need to, and in return, you're gonna commit to coming back to the group when you're ready to engage, when you can. And then the second part of this is to really support it. So um, you're gonna need to do this within the context and protocols that your work you know, offers you, but let them know where to go and what to do and how to do this rest and return in your space. It's nice to encourage them to take deep breaths also. Um, and when you notice youth using this, it's okay to ignore it, but you can also non-verbally ignore, uh, acknowledge or support it like a little subtle nod or something to provide reinforcement that they're using this strategy. Make sure that if they're having a tough time, obviously you're gonna check in as well and see how they're doing, um, make sure they're okay. At work, there are more steps because we don't do this at work. We don't always create, I mean, we might consider the kitchen a space like that. But we don't create a space that's just for breaks, rest and return in a lot of the workspaces that we have. So you gotta find a spot, you know, label it your rest and return space. You're gonna equip it with things that help you relax, disconnect, recharge. And then prioritize it. This might mean making a policy that, exports, that, that supports at least one daily visit to the rest and return space. Um, you want to protect that time. Don't interrupt it. You know, sometimes you could, put, you could post a schedule. Once I had a schedule where everyone had a designated time slot. We also had sites think about how to do rest and return in their cars, um, combining it with like a mindfulness app or something like that. Next slide. So those, that is warm, responsive relationships and supportive environments. But what about skills coaching? So in the question box, would you write for me how teaching is different from coaching? And Kay, I'll need you to read because for some reason I can't see. Sure. Responses. How is teaching different from coaching? What's involved in coaching someone to do a skill? They're all thinking, everyone's thinking. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, teaching is one directional, coaching, let me open this up. Coaching is bi-directional, uh, coaching can be based on experiences, teaching is instruction, coaching is helping them do it, teaching is telling, coaching is showing. Great, these are great. Perfect, so go to the next slide. This is an icon or a, a visual uh, infographic, that's the word I'm looking for, about our self-regulation skills coaching domain, right? So when it comes to learning self-regulation skills, the educator or the teacher and the student participant, they're engaged in a parallel process. And you all nailed this when you're with your responses in the chat. Each has important roles, but a lot of times in our programs, we forget to prioritize some of those really critical roles. So first teach, that's right, it's one directional. It might mean explaining or describing the process. On the left is the, um, the facilitator, the educator in green. On the right is the student, those roles, okay? So as you're teaching, the young person is listening, right? 
but then simultaneously you're modeling the action. It's really important to do it yourself. You're explaining it as you go along, asking if there are questions, and then you're supportively inviting youth to try or practice it. Of course, if you've heard of a growth mindset, you want to prioritize that in uh, in the practice phase where you know mistakes are just strategies on the path to learning, right? Um, and then observing, listening, praising the effort and reinforcing the practice and asking questions like, how did that feel to you? How do you think that went? Coaching involves more back and forth, more practice, more modeling and time for reflection than just teaching. A lot of times we found that curricula do coach or do um, teach, but they often don't prioritize time for practice and reflection. Sometimes that gets short circuited when we're worried about time in workshops. So we wanna make sure that the practice is prioritized and the reflection is prioritized because that's really where the learning takes place. Some examples on the next slide of what skills coaching looks like. So skills coaching can help with any kind of, of regulation. So emotion, cognitive, behavioral. We're looking at awareness of and labeling emotions. So we found that young people actually are not good at labeling their emotions. And a lot of the curricula in relationship education programs sort of assume that youth can do this. And what we did in a recent interview of youth, we found that the number one term youth used to describe their emotions was to call it upset. And upset's really more of a description of physiological response, not a feeling word. So youth need us to help them expand their feeling vocabulary and identify what's going on physiologically and how that rolls up to what I might be feeling. Um, coaching stress management, coaching distress tolerance. It's okay to feel like this is hard. You'll get through it. Modeling self-calming, supporting goal setting, supporting persistence even in the face of challenges. Sports are an excellent way to think about this sort of thing. Um, next slide. So the key thing I want you to take away from these strategies is that they need to work together. Um, if you, if you, Use rest and return, use it in tandem with um, welcoming. We use things like breath to refocus or take note. Take note is kind of like a mindfulness exercise. Using those things in the context of your workshops takes not a ton of time, but has huge benefits. We saw reduction in disengagement in youth in the programs who use these things. We saw um, enhanced participation. We saw stronger uh, facilitator youth relationships and higher morale among the educators. Next slide. So co-regulation helps us think about the youth we serve through the lens of neurodevelopment and relationships and contexts. So when we see challenging behavior as an opportunity to teach self-regulation, it, it has an effect on our motivation, helps us respond in more effective ways to youth. It can be tricky to know which hat to wear, I think, in our roles. So sometimes it's like, should I be like a parent or like a professor or like a preacher or a parole officer? I mean, not that we think we should be those things, but sometimes we might lean into those roles a little bit in our work. And I encourage you to think of yourself really like an athletic coach to support youth development of self-regulation. Um, as coaches rooted in co-regulation, you can really teach and model the skills and processes that youth are counting on you to learn. It's like a mindset that we can adopt, a co-regulation mindset. It's like an internal shift in how we perceive and respond to young people's behavior and emotions and thoughts so that we nurture their development in warm and responsive and non-judgmental ways. Next slide. So the SARM process, it, it provided an opportunity for us to develop these co-regulation strategies with frontline staff and to test them in two small-scale programs um, is how do we put this co-regulation framework into action? And the information and training gave the, the sites that we worked with new clarity about how, like I said, how to serve their participants' needs and deliver their programming. We know that providing co-regulation support may improve youth engagements. Uh, and this is really because facilitators are not only focused on what they're teaching and fidelity to what they're teaching, but focused on how they're teaching it. Um, we believe and we found in our pilot that training staff to understand co-regulation and use these simple strategies, it's a powerful way to enhance program fidelity and improve program outcomes, which is something we all want. Facilitators said, these are some of the lessons we learned, that like they first looked at these strategies as more work. 
you know, it's like, this is going to take time. I need to deliver the curriculum in a set amount of time. How can I use these strategies? But as they were coached and as they increased their comfort, they became more familiar. And then youth responded to the strategies um, with increased comfort and, and, and higher engagement. So integrating them took time. It took intention. It took persistence and ongoing support, but it yielded deeper learning and insights about how to use these strategies. Um, and it really showed a lot of promise for youth engagement. And the second bullet, using the, the co-regulation framework to shape interactions with our team, so between us as researchers and the sites we were working with, that helped them integrate co-regulation in their work with youth. In other words, if you're a program director or a supervisor, how can you take the co-regulation framework and make sure that in your work with your staff, you're prioritizing relationships, environment, and skills coaching, not just benchmark management and that sort of thing, right? Over time, piloting the strategies really, I mean, the educators said, hey, this changed my mindset and allowed me to see my role and the importance of my interactions with youth um, and how critical it is to help them build their self-regulation skills. And then their understanding um, of co-regulation really enhanced their work with youth and their work with one another. So in summary, adolescence is like, it's your moment. It's a critical time for developing these self-regulation skills that contribute to lifelong well-being, and you are key uh, in supporting that. And the results from this project speak to lots of ongoing promise for integrating these strategies and measures. By the way, we have a measures um, thing I'll talk about in just a second. You can integrate those things into your practice without changing your curriculum. Next slide. Let me share with you pictures of some resources that are published on the OPRE website. The first is the executive summary of our final report. If you're really interested in all the details about what we did, you can go to this and see um, more information about the strategies, more information about our process, uh, and all of the formative rapid cycle evaluation design. The second thing, this is what I really want to focus on today. This is a brief for practitioners to integrate co-regulation into your program. This is a how-to guide um, for building staff co-regulation in your program. And it does say so, to support healthy relationships in youth, but this can be done in SRAE programs or lots of other types of programs as well. It gives you some background that I talked about today and then also shares just what steps to do and where to get the resources you need. This will be a precursor to the co-regulation and practice series that's coming out this month. And then the third picture on this slide is a draft, it's a, it's a brief that shares with you all a draft of co-regulation measures. So, okay, that's great. We're gonna integrate co-regulation into our program. How do I know if people are doing it? So these are measures we developed. Now I wanna caution you, they're not fully developed. So they're draft measures. They have some early psychoanalytic studies done on them, but not extensively, right? So, but what you can do this do with these is say, okay, how can I know if facilitators are using co-regulation? Let me ask some of the questions from this measure in my QA assessment or in my observation that I'm doing of, of my workshops and just get a sense of how things are going. So those resources are available for you on the OPRE website. Last slide. And if you want more information, I know I covered a lot of ground and I covered it quickly. Um, please feel free to email me or you can email either of our project officers for more. And I'll turn it over to you, Kay. Great. Thank you, Ali. That was awesome. And uh, you rock. So if you have any questions, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Um, so Ali, what, what are you finding in terms of, um, you, you talked about outcomes are made better when, when adults help youth self-regulate. Do you have any stories about that? Um, about the, um, and Esther, can you go one slide back, please? Um, any stories that would illustrate how a relationship skills program or a teen pregnancy prevention program became more impactful because of self-regulation? Well, so that's a great question. And actually, it, I don't know that I said this before. What I wanna say is that this is a promising approach for enhancing youth self-regulation, but because we're so early in the science, we can't say that these strategies improve youth self-regulation yet. We're in the formative development stages. So we say they're promising. Um, what we saw in, for example, Children's Harbor, 
we had young people getting up and leaving workshops their phone might go off or they might have been um, upset about something that happened outside of the workshop and they would get up and leave but they realized okay i've left the workshop to deal with something i needed to deal with now i can't go back right they didn't have the permission and so what we saw after they enacted the rest and return strategy is that youth had comfort it enhanced their relationship with their facilitators and with the other youth in their group to take care of themselves when they needed to and they stayed their attrition went down pretty significantly i can't share the specifics with you because of the kind of omb clearance that we had <laughs> but um we we saw attrition from programs go down in children's harbor with some of these strategies and so it's pretty obvious to to follow that train of thought hey if they're staying they're getting a higher dose they're having a stronger longer lasting relationship with the program and the facilitators and one another they're going to have a higher benefit from from the program great now I, now i found all the questions um so for those <laughs> of you who are wondering uh, we will be archiving this webinar on our website and along with the resources and a link to the slide so check back on the dibble website next week under webinars free resources webinars um and you'll find it um so Ali, in this time of uh, covid uh are any of these tools able to be implemented online in online yes. learning environments Yes, that's such an important question. And I wonder if we'll be able to create an addendum to the co-regulation and practice series to make some of those things more explicit and not have you having to do the, the um, you know, gymnastics yourself. But Esther, if you could go back, let's see, one, two, three slides to the list of strategies with the, with the co-regulation Venn diagram there. Okay, think about breath to refocus. I didn't teach you that strategy. You'll be able to find it in the packet. Um, in the co-regulation in practice series that comes out this month but that's really about using breath intentionally during transitions in a workshop and um, when you need use to change from like a group activity to a didactic session for example if you if you build in the use of breath okay we're going to do this we're going to go from this group activity and now i'm going to talk to you a little bit more about this next part of the program we're going to go ahead and take an inhale and an exhale and it's going to feel weird to you and to youth at the beginning <laughs> but as you integrate that more readily um it becomes habit and you will notice the impact that is easy to do online and in person we did uh, group agreements or group values online as well and those values were different than they are in person so it might be something like when we're doing group work we leave our cameras on when we're doing didactic lessons in a web-based program we turn our cameras off so that i don't get camera fatigue so those kinds of um, shifts can can be great ways to take the co-regulation strategies and transfer them to a web-based platform. Thank you, that's a good, that's a good answer. So uh, some of you are asking about other tools you can use. I would, I would mention and encourage you to look at Mind Matters, which has a lot on self-soothing, co-regulation, um, helping young people understand trauma and also develop strategies to help them move forward. Um, we can send you a free review copy if you want to put that in the question box, put your email or um, or email us or call our 800 number. We're happy to do that. Um, so, Ali, thank you so much for your presentation. I can tell that people are so excited that they get this news first, and I can see it's just like you talk to a, a very dry sponge out here, and they're all soaking it up. So, really wonderful. Appreciate your time. Thank so, you. next month, you know, we do, oh, thank you for joining us. As I said, um, the webinar will be ready in three days. So that would be uh, Friday or Saturday, but for sure by Monday, um, <clears throat> you'll be able to see an archive, which uh, a webinar along with all the materials and the slides. And please feel free to share it with others. We make it freely available. If you wanna contact me or uh, my customer service staff, there are emails down below. We're gonna send you a small survey. It really helps us to have you complete that so we can find other great speakers. Um, and then the next slide. Ah, next month, um, we're having people from Child Trends 
who've done uh, research into uh, youth relationship education and what they're finding out um, in terms of the research on it and the practice. So for those of you who are in that space or might want to get in that space, it'll be a great educational um, webinar. Let me just go through, before we hang off, um, just going to read a few more comments. Uh, I see the use of co-regulation to not only improve the child personally, but it has brought our relationship so much closer. Trust increased greater, faster with my modeling than just with words alone. Yeah, so it's very, um, what's the word? I mean, you can just see the young people come right to this. So it's so good. Um, thank you for all of the, you who want review copies. Happy to send that to you. Um, great. So it's, it's uh, 2 o'clock Pacific. Thank you, Ali, again. Thank you, Esther, for engineering. And we'll see all the rest of you in June. Take good care. Bye-bye.